Hello and welcome to another post-production tutorial. Today's video is the first part in a three-part series on how to conform in DaVinci Resolve. This is a really important part of the process, so whether you're an editor or a colorist, hopefully this first video should give you the essential checklist of what you need to do when you're handing over from editorial to online. In this first video, uh, we're going to focus on this six page PDF that I've created. It covers the main two workflows that we're gonna cover in the next two videos, the EDL workflow and the scene cut workflow. And also this PDF focuses a little bit on file naming. There's nothing more satisfying than receiving consistent file names from either an editor or colorist. So it's really important point to just cover right off the bat. This PDF is free to download in the link below, so definitely go check that out. So to start off with, let's talk a little bit about file naming. And you can see here what information that I always make sure to include in my file names. So the name of the project, uh, the episode number or the content type, for example, doco or feature or episode two, um, the purpose of the file. It's really important to just state in the file name uh, what this file is actually for. Any technical information, um, so for example, you can see in the web series example, I've included TCIP, timecode and picture. Um, that's a bit of technical information that's very relevant to the file, so it should be stated in the file name. Second to last is the codec, uh, very, very important. The file container is specified by the end of the file name, in this case .mov, but within a quick time, there could be numerous many codecs being used and a date on the end, fairly self-explanatory. The other two rules to keep in mind is to avoid special characters and to avoid spaces. So you can see that I always use underscores in my file names. Okay, cool, so let's get into the EDL workflow. This will be covered more in depth in part two of this video series. So an EDL, an XML, or an AAF, they're all metadata files. They contain the information to rebuild timelines from one software to another. So for example, say we're uh, cutting this film in Premiere, you can export an EDL or XML from the timeline, and this will allow your colorist to rebuild the timeline using the camera raw files within their own software, in this case, DaVinci Resolve. I've created a table with a basic checklist of what you'd need for an EDL, XML, AAF workflow. You can see that we need an EDL file, the raw camera footage, an offline reference file with specific burn-ins that I've mentioned on the PDF, and optionally a copy of the NLE project file, so the Premiere project file, Final Cut, Avid, whatever you're using. This will allow the colorist to just jump in and check things if needed, but again, some colorists don't actually prefer that. Over these two pages, um, I just specify how to flatten your EDL in Premiere. So um, it's really important to not include uh, any audio tracks and not to include 50 video layers and audio layers um, within your EDL. When colorists import these timelines into Resolve or any other software, um, it can be a really messy first look at the project, um, especially if you are referencing video tracks that are no longer used, that are hidden behind other layers. So it's really important to duplicate and then flatten your timeline to export your EDL from there. All of those steps are detailed in these two pages. Lastly, uh, when we do an EDL XML AEF workflow, it's really important to create a reference video. This is a reference file of the locked edit. So it should include all reframes, text elements, graphics, audio mixed down. It should be the entire thing. And you can keep temporary LUTs or grades included in this reference file. That can sometimes be quite useful for the colorist to see what has been done in the edit. This file will be used to check back the conform sequence within Resolve. So the colorist will conform the sequence using the EDL and the raw media, but they need to have confidence that the sequence that they've conformed matches the edit frame for frame. So this is where they'll use this reference video to check this back and make sure that everything matches perfectly. So it's really important that this file is created with the relevant burn-ins and with the relevant information. Okay, luckily the scene cut workflow is a lot simpler. Occasionally the EDL workflow can be complicated and quite time consuming. So in quick turnaround projects, the scene cut workflow sometimes is a lot nicer. The edit is required to render an extremely high bitrate native resolution export. Um, as you can imagine, the only downside here is that we are exporting and compressing the raw footage. This can be a deal breaker, especially if you're working with raw format, such as Red, Arial, or Blackmagic. But if you're not working with raw footage, the extremely high bitrate files that you can export out won't compromise the footage in any way, really. So this can be a really effective, quick way of getting footage from one software to another. The one really important thing to note here, of course, is that all of the temporary LUTs, grades, and graphics need to be removed. If there's any proxies in the editor's timeline, they'll need to be relinked before exporting. And that's it, guys. Hopefully, that's been a nice overview of the two main workflows that I use to bring pictures from editorial into online. Don't forget to check the YouTube description for the free PDF download below, and I will catch you in the next video. Cheers.